Welcome back. I continue my quest to develop Second Commandment theology utilizing the theological encyclopedia. In the last lesson, I stated that we would examine a five-part study on the complications and confusion of sin. The five parts are arena, approach, arsenal, assailants, and the assault. We surveyed in the last lesson the arena, identified, and I identified that as the human soul. And that is the place where the enemy seeks to execute his methods, schemes, and tactics to defend his strongholds or mortify a believer's spiritual nature. This lesson is the second part of our five part series. In this lesson, we will examine the approaches of the enemy. Satan enters the arena with the singular goal, violate the person's conscience to maintain and sustain the pathways of sin. The enemy seeks to stop an unbeliever's relationship or sabotage a believer's fellowship with God. The goal, the overall goal, is to incite the willful disobedience of sin leading to death. The corruption of one's conscience is accomplished by evoking the besetting dysfunction of one's inherited in Adam corruption, which is a person's pride-laced desires, intents, and motives. In other words, the methods, schemes, and tactics of the enemy are designed to complicate and distort one's conception of God's truth, disrupt fellowship with God, and hinder the advance of God's kingdom. Satan's approach is to enhance, complicate, and confuse, and, dis and create disobedience regarding God's truth by using the human soul as a stronghold. The aim being to evoke, maintain, and sustain unbelief and disobedience to God's truth. Now, I've, that's a lot. That's a, a real mouthful. But for the unbeliever, the enemy seeks to prevent the acceptance of God's truth. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. <clears throat> For the believer, the enemy seeks to mortify one's spiritual life. John 10.10a 10, says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy's approach now includes sarcastic, twisted deception using God's word like he did with Eve and Jesus to complicate, confuse, and disrupt one's confidence in God's truth. The enemy now, the enemy's primary objective is to prevent the offensive advance of God's kingdom. And the enemy's method to do to meet his objective is to use temptation, accusation, and isolation to accomplish his objective. Now, in this lesson, we're going to look at temptation. Temptation is the primary approach the enemy uses to induce complication and confusion. Using a medical metaphor, temptation is to the soul like a germ or virus is to the body. The immune system attempts to thwart or attack, thwart the attacks of germs and viruses. If the immune response is successful, wellness is maintained and illness or sickness is avoided. If the immune response is unsuccessful, then illness or sickness results the wellness is and wellness is impaired. The goal of germs and viruses is to use the human body as a home, meaning 
they aim to replicate and thrive within the host organism. However, the consequence of their presence is acute and or chronic illness, sickness, and even death. Similarly, when temptation presents itself, the success or failure of one's spiritual immune system is directly linked to one's level or measure of faith as a barometer for one's fellowship with the Holy Spirit, which is metaphorically holding up one's shield of faith. Romans 12, verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with a sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Now, Paul, con- in concluding his comments about Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, asserts there is nothing about being a living sacrifice and being transformed by the renewing of one's mind and discerning God's will that should encourage or induce pride. The decision to submit should induce a spirit of humility linked to a sober judgment, meaning to think beyond or clear-headed thinking. This verb implies not so much the process, but the direction of thinking with a warning against overestimation. Discerning the level of one's faith starts with introspection. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? unless you fail the test. Sober introspection is a guard against the extremes of naive naivety, twisted or, or unbalanced assumptions. In an earlier lesson on Romans 7, we identified the active conflict between a person's mind and members. The conflict as between one, the law of evil, two, the law of God, three, the law of sin, and four, the law of one's mind. The result is that one is willfully predisposed to his or her sinful nature that taints one's commitment to God. Therefore, one must consistently and perpetually evaluate his or her thoughts desires, motives, intentions, actions, and habits. The gauge one uses to examine his or her measure or level of faith is one's awareness of his or her need for God. I contend that forsaking one's first love described in Revelation 2 verses 1 through 7 is tantamount to losing one's awareness of his or her need for God. It is, now think about this. It is not about working for God, regular reading of the Bible, praying or witnessing for the faith. It is about losing one's fear of the Lord. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Therefore, losing one's fear of the Lord is tantamount to the pursuit of folly. Paradoxically, losing awareness of one's need for God happens when God is meeting the one's needs. When God is meeting our needs, that's when we're most vulnerable. When we feel, or when one feels secure for the future and well-fed in the presence, It is then that one is most vulnerable to the spirit of pride and self-sufficiency, ignoring God's truth or believing that he or she is immune to the consequences of violating or suppressing God's truth. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful lest you fall. Proverbs 11, 2a says, When pride comes, 
then comes disgrace. And Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, and a, a haughty spirit before a fall. Conversely, when one suffers, he or she is very aware of his or her emotional, mental, and spiritual, and physical need for God. We really know it when we're suffering. Therefore, the enemy's approach is to complicate and confuse one's mind, will, and emotions to violate one's conscience through pride and self-sufficiency or through anger, fear, and misinformation to tip the scale toward unbelief and disobedience in order to impede one's quest for godliness and the willingness to keep God's commands, submit to God, submit to the guidance and enablement of the Holy Spirit, and to discern God's will by which fellowship with the Holy Spirit wanes or waxes. <clears throat> That's a lot. So, the level or measure of one's faith is also the level or measure of one's unbelief. Mark 9, 24 says, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Overcoming unbelief is a challenge for every believing sinner due to the complication and confusion induced by the enemy from his stronghold in one's sinful nature. However, fellowship is restored, meaning it waxes, when the repentant believer confesses, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. After confession, God spiritually rebukes the believing sinner's activity as a living sacrifice in the body of Christ. Now, I'm defining spiritual reboot as a restart to effective faith-based decision-making, resetting one's mind, will, and emotion, and clearing one's conscience of guilt, shame, filth, and blame, thereby reloading fellowship and the peace of God, especially after a volitional power or system failure caused by human complicity and duplicity with the enemy through one's sinful nature. The enemy, now think about this, the enemy's approach is to attack elements of the person's soul. Now let's break that down. <clears throat> when temptation is aimed at the mind, the enemy seeks to distort or confuse one's thinking. The enemy, the enemy seeks to convince one to bypass protection, create doubt, reject warnings, create discontentment, promote self, incite faulty reasoning, override caution by appealing to one's secret desires and, and, make, and promises of fulfillment using misleading logic. Now, how does the enemy do that? <clears throat> The enemy may use, one, the dart of reason, as he did with Adam and Eve, to dispute God's truth and question the veracity of God's word in that he or she may not understand or cannot com comprehend God's will. Two, the dart of baiting, bribing, luring, and enticement. James 1.14 says, But each person is tempted when he or she is lured and enticed by his or her own desire. Lure and enticement are fishing metaphors for drawing prey away from shelter to trap or hook them. The enemy's tactic is to use the person's evil intent, motive, and desires to ensnare him or her. Three, the dart of the seduction. James 1.15 says, Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. 
The enemy's tactic here is to offer the pleasure of an intimate consummation with the object of one's desire. The consummating moment is a rush during the sin act that one wants even though he or she knows it's wrong and that, and that feelings of guilt and shame will follow. So, after the consummation, one's full-grown desire conceives and bears, and bears its own child, sin, which grows into maturity and bears, its, bears a grandchild, which is death. That's, 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 that's the wages of sin, is death. When temptation is aimed at the conscience, the enemy seeks to violate the conscience by causing one to ignore or reject God's law and truth written on his or her heart. Four biblical dysfunctions of the conscience are weak, which means feeble and without strength or sick. Two, a defiled conscience, which is corrupted, tainted, or contaminated. Three, guilty, awkward, uncomfortable, embarrassed, tormented, or haunted. And four, seared, which means without feelings, callous, hardened, and insensitive. The enemy uses, then, the dart of blame, which is an inward manifestation of a violated conscience where one assigns fault. And then, two, the dart of denunciation is the outward manifestation of a violated conscience where one condemns openly, okay? When sin is aimed at the will, the enemy seeks to interdict the volition. Some of God's commands cannot be obeyed without self-denial because they cross us in circumstances where one's desire, where one desires self-rule. In that case, one must deny his or her own intents, motives, and desires before he or she can do God's will. Now, the darts. Number one, the dart of self-indulgence runs with the tide of one's misdirected intent, wrong motives, and secret desires, causing the synergy to be more forceful. The enemy tempts by asking, Will you serve a God who capriciously denies your desires, dreams, and wants, who thwarts you in everything? It seems that God always wants to ask you to give up what you love the most. That's, that's, that was Satan's trick with Adam and Eve. Two, the dart of fairness. It is used to call into question God's ethical motive where God seems capricious insensitive or, or obtuse. Psalm 22, verse 1, which is uh, a messianic psalm, and, and it is one of Jesus' saying, say it goes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Three, the dart of entrapment distorts one's volition by inducing one to sin by means of fraud or undue persuasion to later bring an incriminating accusation against that person. The enemy seeks to, in, to accuse the believer before God of unrighteous conduct and wrongdoing to show in disobedience and rebellion that that person is unworthy. The enemy shows that with the right stimuli, one will be disloyal and disgrace God. Revelations 12, 10b says, For the accuser of the brethren accuses them before our God day and night. So, when temptation is aimed at the emotions, the enemy seeks to evoke depression or lamenting, leading to suicide, whether it be mental, moral, spiritual, or physical self-destruction. Proverbs 18.14 says, A man or woman's spirit will endure sickness, but a wounded spirit, who can bear it? The enemy uses 
one, the dart of bitterness or resentment that manifests in a person who suffers moral injury or spiritual wounding in any form. Moral injury and spiritual wounding registers in one's core, which is the image of God, manifested as a shipwrecked faith. Two, and I'm going to say more about that in a minute. Two, the dart of doubt, fear, skepticism, or confusion about God's guidance, particularly regarding deeply held values, are a catalyst by which the enemy stimulates and cites all forms of disobedience, as well as destructive homicidal ideation and self-destructive suicidal ideation, leading one to reject God and all other authorities. So, overall, the enemy's approach is to damage, degrade, or destroy one's faith in God's truth. Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The justifying relationship established when one believes God cannot be reversed by any scheme or tactic of the enemy. The only avenue of counterattack that the enemy has is through one's conscience, literally to induce one to lower his or her shield of faith to allow the flaming and venomous pride-tipped darts of doubt, fear, and judging to wound one's spirit, soul, and body. 1 Timothy 1.19 says, Hold on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Now, let's break that down. The concept of holding or having or keeping faith and a good conscience are expressed in close inter- close interrelation in Paul's schematic of the inner workings of a believing sinner. Faith is that posture of trust in God that animates the individual's personal relationship with God. The good conscience is the seat of volition, the point of attack for the waxing and waning of one's fellowship with the Holy Spirit. A good conscience is an ethical description of what the Spirit does within the believer to apprehend or understand or even discern God's law. Again, the condition of one's conscience is determined by one's awareness of his or her need for God. One's disposition toward the gospel suggests that the ordering of faith is followed by the good conscience. To be engaged in godly faith and behavior, one must be aware of his, again, of his or her need for God. Therefore, the distance between waxing and waning of authentic versus inauthentic faith is one's act of rejection by forsaking one's first love. Now, think about this. The grammar makes, or the grammar implies that one rejects a good conscience when he or she, through any act of neg- negligence or defiance, forsakes one's first love or loses one's fear of the Lord, which is losing awareness of one's need for God. So, Without this norm of godliness to appropriately respond to God's law written on his or her heart, this renders one's conscience, then, incapable of discerning the authentic from the inauthentic truth and conduct. Now remember, the law only functions to reveal sin. It does not empower Holy living. The law doesn't doesn't do this. So, 
Rejecting the good conscience is neither a reference to a specific immoral tendency that destroyed their faith, nor to a dualistic absorption in the cognitive dimension of faith that ignores practical ethics, but the stress is more on the integrity of the believer. The parts are interdependent, and the failure of anyone will affect the other. Now think about this. A person cycles between salvation by grace alone that relies on the inner working of the Holy Spirit in a converted heart and a materialistic works righteousness approach that relies on the power and resolve of one's will, which we know isn't going to be satisfactory. The decision then, this decision of negligence or defiance results in behavior that does not conform to godliness. Paul uses the metaphor of shipwreck to signify the catastrophic scale of damage caused by one's rejection. But what or whom has suffered shipwreck? Salvation by justifying faith cannot be lost. However, sanctifying faith, also known as fellowship with the Spirit, can be damaged or diminished by willfully grieving or quenching the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the disaster of faith must be seen in connection with being without the Spirit or in waning fellowship with the Spirit. Unbelievers suffer disaster due to their rejection of God's truth. Believers suffer disaster due to their negligence with God's truth. The enemy's approach is to promote disaster. That's the bottom line. So, that's a lot, and a, and a lot to process. So, we are stopping here. In this lesson, we continued our examination of the complication of sin using the theological encyclopedia to reveal more threads of a practical wisdom-based theology. My goal is to proclaim and demonstrate that only God, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, can repair what is broken in humanity. We are examining the efficacy of one-on-one -on -one preaching and hospitality. So, may God bless and keep you. Amen, amen, and amen.